This video is brought to you by Loot Crate, the monthly subscription service for epic geek and gamer items and pop culture gear. Comic book artists sometimes hide little secrets in the issues they are drawing. Sometimes it could be funny cameos, hidden games, or even insults to their bosses or fellow comic creators. Sometimes it can even reference really cool YouTube channels. Welcome to Comic Misconceptions, I'm Scott, and the comic that references our channel is a real comic book called Suicide 5, and it's just one of the seven secret things we'll be talking about today that artists have hidden inside of comics. Obviously, there are endless examples of these things, but I simply wanted to share with you some of my favorites, and how could I not start with that one? Though, honestly, I don't think we'll ever have a video that has as many views as the one in the comic did, which is a bit discouraging. So, continuing with our list, let's talk about sex. This is one of the more well-known ones, but I think it bears repeating because of how funny it is. New X-Men number 118 from 2001 sneaks in over a dozen instances of the word sex hidden in the background art of the story. Many people have speculated on the significance behind this. There are lots of theories about what it means in terms of the story. Was Emma Frost using her mind powers to break the fourth wall and influence the creative team behind the comic? Was a character who appeared in the story named John Sublime supposed to be a reference for these hidden subliminal messages? Was it intended to hint at Cyclops having cheated on Jean Grey with Emma Frost? The answer is none of these. None of them. No, not a, not, nope. While at first the artist of the issue, Ethan Van Skyver, claimed that it was never intentional and people were just seeing things, he later revealed that the instances of the word sex were obviously deliberate, but it had nothing to do with the story. He was simply upset with Marvel at the time for some reason and decided to have a little fun. Quote, it had nothing to do with anything at all. It's also been speculated that it was an effort by the entire creative team, including the inkers, colorist, and possibly even the writer, Grant Morrison, for making the story include sexual undertones. This would not be the only instance where an artist would rebel a little and poke fun at the higher ups. Enter Al Milgram, a prolific penciler, inker, writer, and editor for tons of Marvel comics before leaving to become a freelancer. You may recognize Milgram's name from Ant-Man, where Scott Lang and his crew were staying at the Milgram Hotel, a nod to the legend, even though he never actually worked on any Ant-Man comics as far as I could find. Milgram apparently really despised Marvel's former editor-in-chief and DC's current editor-in-chief, at least at the time of this video, Bob Harris. And really, that's pretty understandable when you realize that Harris oversaw the Clone Saga. Now, the Clone Saga was a mess for many reasons. I'm sure we'll tackle it in a video someday, but let's get back on track. So for some reason that escapes the history books, Milgram hated Harris. So when Harris left Marvel and was replaced by Joe Quesada, Milgram was ecstatic about this, and his excitement showed in his work. Literally. Milgram was hired as a freelance artist to work on a Marvel comic called Universe X Spidey, which sounds like the most 90s title you can give a Spider-Man comic, even though it came out in the early 2000s. Hidden in a bookshelf on the background of one of the panels from the story, Al Milgram left a secret message regarding Harris having left Marvel. And if it's a bit hard to read, allow me to help out with the power of editing. It says, quote, Bob Harris, ha ha, he's gone. Good riddance to bad rubbish. He was a nasty SOB, end quote. Not the subtlest of people, that Milgram fellow. Unfortunately, the secret was found and edited out for the main run of the comic, but the unedited version with the insult was sent out to retailers before it officially hit shelves, meaning there are a few thousand copies of the recalled comic still floating around out there. And if you have one of these, let me know. I I kind of want one. Let's move on to a lighter topic. Like trolling, artist Linnell Yu is known for such works as Superman Birthright, Super Crooks, one of my personal favorite Mark Miller books, but mostly lots and lots of Marvel books, including lots of Avengers and X-Men titles. And you, uh, this you, not you, you, well, this is gonna get confusing. Anyway, you loves to tease Marvel about one of their creations, Howard the Duck. When he gets an opportunity, he sneaks Howard into the comics that he's working on. Usually it's whenever there's a big crowd of characters, like in New Avengers, you can see him right there. In the comic book event, Secret Invasion, you drew up some promotional art that also doubled as the cover for the lead up issue. A big crowd of characters and one of them, Howard the Duck. Marvel editor-in-chief Joe Quesada even had to come out and clarify that Howard wasn't actually going to be in Secret Invasion, you was just messing with him. Additionally, the writer of the Secret Invasion event, Brian Michael Bendis, reportedly explained that he specifically told Lenel Yu not to sneak in a Howard cameo into the actual story, but of course you couldn't resist. This you not, well, you probably couldn't resist either. I couldn't. In Secret Invasion number six, we once again have a large crowd of heroes and can you spot the hidden Howard? I'll give you a moment. He's right there. He also makes an appearance in issue number seven, but that one is 
significantly easier to find. Turns out the reason why Yu keeps throwing Howard the Duck into his comics is because he wants Marvel to stop pretending like he doesn't exist. He reportedly said, quote, I'm making Marvel pay for creating him, and if he's not dead, they need to use him. This really isn't a problem these days. Howard has seen a surge in popularity since his appearance in Guardians of the Galaxy, and he's even featured back in the comic book universe. Even though we all know that the real Howard was stolen from Marvel and the one that remains is a soulless clone. And for a bit more trolling, we turn to the art of swipes. Swiping in comics just means that one artist is intentionally copying covers, panels, character stances, or even entire pages of another artist or artist's work. There are whole websites dedicated to finding these swipes. Many artists have been guilty of this, so I don't mean to call attention to one guy as if he's the only person who's ever done it, but this one certainly does have a pretty funny ending. When comic book artist Roger Cruz was starting out in the industry, he often swiped art from popular artists like Jim Lee, which to be fair, he was not the only one to do so. There are countless instances of artists swiping from Jim Lee, but Cruz also swiped from a then up and coming artist named Joe Majorera. Not a particularly smart move on Cruz's part. You see, Majorera had only been penciling comics for maybe a year at this point, therefore he didn't have that wide of a library to swipe from. So when Cruz started swiping art like this one, and this one, and even this one, twice, it was pretty obvious that he was getting those images from Majorera. To retaliate, Mad included a little Easter egg in Uncanny X-Men number 325, since he figured that Cruz would be reading every comic he drew. On the surface, it doesn't look like anything out of the ordinary, but if you look a little closer at the newspaper headline, you'll see the phrase, Cruz swipes again. Brilliant. And apparently there's no bad blood between the two these days, so that's good. This next one is one of my personal favorites. Todd McFarlane is famous for a few things, including his work on Spider-Man comics. On almost every cover of a Spidey comic McFarlane worked on, starting with Amazing Spider-Man number 303, he would draw hidden spiders like this, and this, and this. He would even hide multiple spiders on a single image and would write a number next to his signature to clue everyone into how many to look out for. If there was no number, there'd only be one spider, but some covers would have two, three, four, or even more. On the cover of Spider-Man number one, a comic that McFarlane both penciled and wrote, he had drawn so many little spiders that he sincerely lost count and just threw up a question mark by his signature. I was too lazy to count how many there actually are, so if you have that kind of patience, let me know in the comments. Jim Balent did a similar thing with Catwoman he hid cats on every cover of the series, but they weren't always as subtle as McFarlane's spiders. Some were very obvious, like these cats on a car or on this trash can. They'd eventually get more tricky, like a cat on the handle of a knife or in Catwoman's hair, but the best one, the best one, has to be the time that Belent drew a catfish on the cover. Amazing. Speaking of Mark Miller, which would have been a great segue a few minutes ago when I actually was talking about Mark Miller, he wrote a comic called Chrononauts that has a really interesting secret on the cover of the first issue. So secret, in fact, that according to the artist, Sean Gordon Murphy, somewhere around 93 to 99% of people will never be able to see it. Now, I want to try something. I don't want to influence you by telling you what to look for. However, I will tell you where to look for it, right here inside of this clock face. We should all be able to see the cracks and the tick marks and the yellow dot in the middle, but according to Miller and Murphy, a very small percentage of you should be able to see a hidden image overlaid on top of the entire clock face. A symbol of some kind. Most people believe this to be a hoax, and honestly, their scientific explanation of how it works is based in science that merely sounds like it could be true, but is total nonsense. Stating that artistic people who are right brain dominant are more likely to see it, even though the whole left brain, right brain argument is a completely false understanding of how the brain actually works. Source in the description. This also came out not too long after the dress phenomenon, so it's possible that the comic was simply trying to ride that wave of one group of people seeing one thing and another group seeing something else. Regardless, I wanna know if this is really true. If you see it, write it in the comments. But if you don't see it, but know what's supposed to be there, don't spoil it for anyone. I'll reveal what the hidden image is on Monday's video. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss it. And what did I miss? What other Easter eggs have artists sneaked into comics? I know there are likely hundreds of things, so we'll probably do a part two sometime in the future with your suggestions. As I mentioned at the beginning, this video is brought to you by Loot Crate, the monthly subscription service that brings you geeky and gamer goodies right to your doorstep. January's crate is invasion themed with exclusive items from aliens, space invaders, the fifth element, and the X-Files. What? That sounds amazing. Where can I get one of those, Scott? Why are you holding out on me?
You can go to lootcrate.com forward slash nerdsync and use the coupon code nerdsync to save 10% on your crate. You don't want to miss out on this crate because after the 19th, it'll be too late. You will have missed the invasion, which in this case is a bad thing. Again, that's lootcrate.com slash nerdsync using the coupon code nerdsync. And if you want to learn more about comic book art, we recently did a whole series of videos exploring why comic book superheroes are designed the way they are. It explores the real world origins behind tights, capes, wearing underwear on the outside, and more. You can click right here to go watch the first episode in the series. Don't forget to hit that big sexy subscribe button so you don't miss out on all the new videos we make for you every week that explore the history, science, art, and philosophy behind your favorite comic book superheroes. Once again, I'm Scott, and I'll see you right here on Friday for another video. See ya.